One of our themes for this weekend is, is, that, is a consideration of the contemporary challenges that subvert true agency with technology. There are plenty of worries about the consequences of technology abroad today among our chattering classes. The threat of environmental degradation following on the emergence of, te of the techno-industrial society has been a going concern for at least a century. The application of biotechnology to human beings, especially during the embryonic stage of our lives, has raised the, the two-edged promise of both the alleviation of grave suffering and the massive body count among our most vulnerable brethren. We are familiar with the ill consequences of personalized digital technology that it has uh, for how we spend our time and the substance of, of what we fill our minds with. Not to mention the emerging evidence of the developmental harm done to children reared mostly in front of screens. To this standard list of technological woes, I also add our current obesity and op opiate epidemics. Certainly the availability of easily produced and distributed food stuff is one of the great boons of the technological age. But it has also addicted us to cheap pseudo foods that are wrecking havoc on our bodies and our healthcare systems. The development of wonder pain relieving drugs like Oxycontin have done much to spare many of us uh, horrid pain suffered by prior generations. Though the availability of those drugs has also sent many human lives down a spiral of degradation, often with mortal consequences. These are all grave concerns. And they are particularly pressing today as the speed of technological advance seems to pile problems up faster than our intellectuals can even enumerate them. Notice, however, that these worries are all a, a, a bit hackney. They're common com complaints. Going back to the tale of the Tower of Babel in Genesis, we have always known that technological innovation carries unforeseen consequences that should puncture our pride in our ability to contrive our environment to fit our projects. That is, that is not to take away from the gravity of these concerns as practical matters, but merely to say that there are queries of deeper philosophical interest in this vicinity that we might do well to tarry over today. First notice that our worry is, as stated in the theme of our gathering, not over the grave material consequences of technology, but its subversion of our true agency. In our earlier, earlier discussions, I have painted a picture of human agency as an ability to operate by reasons, to make those reasons explicit, and to put those reasons under rational scrutiny. I have emphasized, maybe with a bit of irony, that this notion of freedom entails both a sort of independence, we can take responsibility for the justification of our actions, and a sort of dependence, we are, at all stages of development, to some degree beholden to our friends in a common project to take such responsibility. What are the consequences of our modern technological way of being in the world for this understanding of distinctively human agency? At the mention of existentialist uh, critique of modern technology, Martin Heidegger's seminal essay, A Question Concerning Technology, is most likely to come to mind. Today, however, I plan to discuss a lesser known work fitting that same description. Kiji Nishitani was a leading member of Japan's Kyoto School, where he had long held a chair for philosophy and religion. He was both a Zen master and one of the most insightful Japanese interpreters of Western philosophy and theology in the last century. Not surprisingly, given his Zen background, Nishitani was particularly important in the Japanese reception of Christian variations on mysticism and existentialism. His writings are full of discussions of both Eckhart and Kierkegaard, along with the usual list of 20th century European philosophical luminaries. There is also a clear affinity with the fundamental ontology of being and time in much of his work, and Nishitani actually studied briefly with Heidegger in the 1930s though he is certainly influenced by Heidegger in the broad structure of his existential phenomenology, as far as I am able to tell, Nishitani's critique of our technological way of being is entirely independent of Heidegger's, and we should take him as an original thinker in his own right on this issue. I'm going to frame our discussion today in terms of Nishitani's critique of the modern technological attitude, both because of its intrinsic merits and because I, I believe it dovetails in very interesting ways with much that the Aristotelian Thomistic tradition might have to say about this. In a major essay, Nility in Sunyata, 
Nishitani, Nishitani pardon me, develops the conception of technology as a mark of human distinction. Indeed, Nishitani makes the case that mechanical technology is both the most striking expression of human dignity and the high point in the evolution of the universe itself. Nishitani begins by accepting at face value a basic modern understanding of the universe as governed by mathematically expressible physical laws that describe patterns of blind, efficient causality. That is, the laws of nature, considered in themselves, are purely descriptive principles determining how things at the most fundamental level just happen to operate inexorably in the universe we just happen to have on our hands. Nature, considered in terms of its most basic physical constituents, is non-teleological. It serves no good or purpose. The laws of nature in themselves are what they are, so to speak, on Nishitani's view. Considered in this way, the universe runs entirely on indifferent push from behind, without any pull towards a good or ultimate meaning. We should not be too quick to write the universe off as meaningless on Nishitani's phenomenology of nature, though. Even though the laws governing the physical universe are non-teleological, they are mathematically specifiable, in his view. Thus, while this basic structure of things is in itself a meaningless nility, to use Nishitani's phrase, going nowhere ultimately, it is nevertheless rational in some broad sense inasmuch as it can be captured by mathematical reason. That is, the laws of nature are rational inasmuch as they can be understood rationally. Though in and of itself the universe is not going anywhere, it is a sensible place because it can be made sense of scientifically. The problem, however, is that at the, at the elemental level, there is nothing to whom the universe can make sense. The laws of nature govern the basic physical, physical constituents of the universe without any expression or apprehension of their, of their rational character. This may raise an eyebrow for we readers of Aquinas' Fifth Way. An, an intrinsically rational universe composed entirely of non-living things would be truncated and pathetic, an entirely undisplayed masterpiece. That sorry state of affairs is happily not to be found in our universe, as Nishitani points out, that in the activities of living things there is a, quote, kind of appropriation of the laws of nature, it is a kind of apprehension prior to apprehension proper, an apprehension to which the ambiguous term instinct is usually applied, end quote. That is, the living universe does not merely follow the laws of nature in the way that an iron ball hurtling to the center mass of the earth inexorably flies to its destiny. That is not to say that the protozoa exercise some sort of free or abstract reasoning while they gobble up micronutrients. The point is that the living thing exploits or uses the laws of nature for its good. The protozoa appropriate the laws into their being through the evolutionary process, uh, such that they conform their nature to those principles in a way that serves their good. If we take Aquinas' notion of knowledge as the conformity relation between the knowing subject and the known object, then in the very being of the protozoa, along with every, every, everything else in the biosphere, there is an implicit knowing or apprehension of the basic principles of the universe. The living thing is a conformity to nature, a sort of apprehension of nature in its very operation. Thus, the emergence of living things and their practical appropriation of the laws of nature, the, the, the intrinsic rational in, in that, the intrinsic rational nature of the universe reaches a higher level of expression. It becomes implicitly known. As Nishitani puts it, quote, these controlling laws become manifest in living organisms as something lived and acted out in a sort of intrinsic appropriation. The laws of nature only appear when these organisms live and act and thereby embody and appropriate those laws. Instinctive behavior is the law of, is the law of nature become manifest. End quote. Once again, to invoke scholastic terminology, we might say along with Nishitani that, the, that organism re represent an increased perfection of the universe because as implicit apprehensions of nature, they have a more perfect participation in the rational principles governing the universe than do non-living things. Notice, however, that the arrival of living beings not only uh, Excuse me. Notice, however, that the arrival of, of living beings 
uh, brings not only apprehension, but also meaning in some sense. Because the apprehension of the laws of nature in intrinsic behavior, quote, displays a purposive or teleological character. The rational order of existence comes to assume a teleological character on the field wherein living organisms come into being and instinct becomes active. Psycho, uh, physical chemical laws are here synthesized into a teleological structure and become, so to speak, its raw material." End quote. For Nishitani, the miracle of life is constituted not only by the implicit apprehension of rational principles of the universe, but by the further fact that these rational principles are for the first time put to the service of purposes benefiting living things. Organisms, by their ontological appropriation of the laws of nature, introduce value into the universe. The protozoa conform to the rational principles of the universe in order to obtain their good and avoid harm. Even this simple life form aims at something. Thus, the universe is not just the blind play of particles beholden to mathematical principles, but a place wherein a drama unfolds, the story of the flourishing or extinction of proactive beings, based on the degree to which they can express the rational nature of the universe itself in their purposive behavior. In short, the organism is the locus of the universe, universe's coming to be implicitly self-apprehensive and meaningful. Here too, Nishitani would agree that this is a higher per participation and greater perfection of the universe. Human beings are appropriations of the rational principles of the universe in our very being as animals. Moreover, our animality con constitutes the locus of meaning, value, and purpose in what would otherwise be a meaningless and blind world, according to Nishitani. Though our, our metabolism, respiration, reproduction, and the like are perfections of material reality, we are not special in this way. As much can be said of everything from the lowliest single cellular life forms all the way up to the most sophisticated primates. True enough. But the rational and teleological character of the universe takes an even greater leap with the emergence of humanity because of our uniquely teleological way of being. By producing even the most basic tools and contrivances, human beings consciously appropriate the rational principles of the universe to specific practical ends. We are not merely programmed by our biological history when we produce teleological innovations, but apply our implicitly rational apprehension of the laws of nature to novel situations. As Nishitani puts it, quote, unlike simple instinct, technology implies an intellectual apprehension of these laws of one sort or another. When pre-civilized man learned to make tools and use them, his skill contained an embryo and understanding of the laws of nature, qua laws of nature, end quote. Thus, with human technology, nature's rational character is not only expressed implicitly, but explicitly. Human contrivance uh, requires not preter apprehension, but, but apprehension simpliciter. That is, the laws of nature, quote, become manifest as laws through the technology of man. Unlike the case of instinct, the laws have become manifest in activity by being refracted through knowledge. In short, uh, end quote. In short, with human technology, the rational and technological nature of the universe is no longer an implicit instinctual appropriation, but a conscious and autonomous manifestation. In scholastic terms, we can say there is a profound interplay between formal and final causality that comes into play with the advent of human technological innovation. The human being, through its distinctive rational powers, is able to grasp the forms of natural beings, which ground the laws of nature, and exploit this knowledge so as to further his or her own pursuits of the ultimate good for its kind. Technology, because it is an intersection of formal and final causality, is an expression of distinctively human theoretical and practical reason. Technology expresses our distinctive nature as both knowers and doers. Technology, however, is not only an expression of our particular per human perfections. Nishtani would say that the universe is itself perfected in human technology because by such activity we rationalize the universe. As our technological innovations occupy greater regions of being, nature becomes an ever more explicit apprehension of a rational and purposive order. 
Since it's result, it, it results in relatively stable and self-operative entities, the highest form of this activity is construction of machines. As Nishtani puts it, quote, the rational character of existence exhibits a manifold perspective whose teleological character becomes increasingly more marked as it ascends the levels of being until it eventually comes to complete actualization in the machine, when the purposive activity of man functions in a purely mechanical manner. Here the rule of the laws of nature may be said to attain its final and deepest point." End quote. In other words, with the machine, the laws of nature become both fully explicit and completely meaningful. But, the, but that only happens through human practice. Nishtani sees something of a felicitous paradox in all this. Quote, the higher we proceed up the, up the chain of being, the deeper the reach of the rule of law. But at the same time, the more fully actualized the freedom of things that use those laws. End quote. In other words, the greater living things are able to conform their activities to the law of nature, to act as apprehensions of laws of nature, the greater they are likewise liberated from those very same laws of nature. By learning to understand, anticipate, and exploit the workings of nature and bringing their behavior in line with these patterns, creatures are then able to live uh, in ways that allow them to flourish far beyond what merely blind adherence to natural law would allow. Moreover, the machine is the high point of this happy irony. Quote, it is only in human work that is clearly seen that obedience to laws uh, directly implies freedom from their bondage. Nowhere in the, is this more radically apparent than at the level of technology, uh, where, where, at the level where technology becomes mechanized. End quote. Our technological contrivances are indeed ways of consciously and autonomously obeying the laws of nature. Conformity, not mere determination, a free participation. But it is these very techniques, especially our machines, that subsidize our pursuit of other ends that reach beyond anything anticipated by our participation in the laws of nature. Aristotle famously observed that leisure, freedom from merely making a living, is a necessary condition for philosophy. It is our machines that have provided us the time and space for lives of relative leisure, at least as compared to the lives of our, our primitive and less, mechanically, less mechanical ancestors. And this extra time is what allows us to indulge truly humane contemplative pursuits. Thus, mechanical technology is a conscious, explicitly intentional obedience to nature that at the same time opens up for us a realm of being that transcends nature. We are not merely sensate animals that follow nature to the satisfaction of our biologically based desires. Rather, we are rational animals that use nature to liberate ourselves from nature. Thus, the human technological way of being, quote, is a rule over nature far, uh, more far-reaching than the self-rule of nature itself. Hence, we see here in greatest clarity a relationship according to which subordination to the control of law directly implies liberation from it. All right. Mechanical technology then occasions what is most perfect and most distinctive in human nature, at least on Nishtani's view. Our conscious obedience to the laws of nature liberates us from the demands of mere survival for the sake of higher contemplative goods. Culture is expensive and it is bought and paid for by the machine. We also note how mechanical technology expresses the curious halfling status of the human person. We are neither beast nor god, angel nor brute. We are, we are material beings, uh, but, but yet nothing in matter can possibly exhaust the human ontology. I take it that this is why Nishtani finds technology so intriguing. The, ma the machine occasions our fullest transcendence through our deepest involvement with the mundane. Whatever its merits may be, there really is no more apt expression of the mysteriously embodied nature of humanity than our technological way of being in the world. As should be obvious, with the depressingly long enumeration of grave technological difficulties that began my discussion, our story does not end on such a happy note. Technology is not only our liberator from nature, but it ultimately threatens our re-enslavement to an even greater degree than were our pre-mechanical ancestors. In other words, there is also an infelicitous paradox of human technological being. 
With the introduction of mach machine technology on a grand scale, quote, we must speak of the controller becoming the controlled, end quote. As our interpretation of nature becomes ever more abstract and mechanical, and our reliance on the, machine, on the resulting machine technology continues to expand to the point of saturating our lives, quote, the laws of nature reassume control over man who controls the laws of nature. The situation is usually referred to as the tendency towards the mechanization of man, toward the loss of, loss of the human. Needless to say, it points to one of the basic features constituting the contemporary crisis of culture, end quote. What is this mechanization of humanity of which Nishtani speaks? No doubt, once we have turned the corner towards machine-based civilization, there is a sense in which our lives are not liberated for the sake of humane pursuits, but ensnared by what is supposed to be our very source of autonomy. As much as saving us time, our machines dominate our time. This is certainly a, a common critique of, the, of technological society, and one that no doubt has much traction. How many times have I delayed the writing of this lecture in the service of software updates from my laptop? It was actually driving me crazy. Okay, so, uh, fair enough. But I believe Nishtani has something much more profound in mind. Consider the following remarks, quote, there appears a mode of being wherein a man situates himself on the freedom of nility and behaves as if he were using the laws of nature entirely from without. It is a mode of being of the subject that has adapted itself to a life of raw and impetuous desire, of naked vitality. The growing affirmation of a pre-reflective pre human mode of being that is totally non-rational and non-spiritual, the stance of the subject that locates itself on a nility that per pursues its own desires unreservedly." End quote. In other words, the success of our machine technology has turned us to a state of unreflective instinct. Our machines have made us so accustomed to the satisfaction of our desires that we have now come to presume that our desires ought to be satisfied as a part of the natural course of things. It is, it is the satisfaction, it is the unsatisfied desire that has become the anomaly, at least in our mentality. There is no need to weigh, desire against, weigh desires against each other so as to decide which is the most worthy of pursuit. Supplies for desire satisfaction are seemingly unlimited because our machines, to use Heidegger's and before him Junger's apt phrase, have rendered uh, nature a ready reserve for our consumption. Thus, there is no need to reflect on the worthiness of any given desire, and our ability to engage in such ethical reflection is greatly diminished. Indeed, the notion of evaluating the worthiness of desire seems quite foreign to many of the denizens of the technological society. Sample and indulge freely because our machines can always make more. Thus, with the rise of machine-based civilization, there's an overwhelming tendency to think of the satisfaction of any desire as a self-justifying practical possibility. Once we have come to expect that our desires can and will be sated in the ordinary run of things, there is then no expectation that one might need to live with unfulfilled desire, however trivial or grave, as integral to the human condition. Because our machines have promised us an unlimited lot, stock of fulfillment. Moreover, there is there, the, more, moreover, where this unreflective indulgence, indulgence of desire carries unwanted consequences, we have likewise grown accustomed to expect our machines to provide us with the technological means of avoiding such fallout. Under the illusion of mechanical supremacy, we are apt to leave our distinctively human practical rationality to sit and rot. In other words, a complete dependence on machine technology absolves us of the responsibility for our reasons and grants us the illusion of, our, of, our, uh, of a complete independence from other humans by fostering fantasies of infallibility and infinite satisfaction of our desires. It subverts the very notion of free agency I've defended this weekend. It was our ability reflectively and rationally to appropriate nature to, to human ends that marked the great human advance. Thus, Nishtani claims that our unreflective carte blanche expectation of satisfaction is essentially to render homo, homo sapiens to a sub-personal existence. Quote, 
Man shows the counter-dependency to forfeit his human nature and to mechanize it. At the, at the extreme of the wholesale control that the laws of nature exercise through human work, these laws come under the control of man uh, as, as a subject in pursuit of desires, one who behaves as if he stood outside of all law and control. The emergence of the mechanization of human life and the transformation of man into a completely non-rational subject uh, in pursuit of its desires are fundamentally bound up with one another." End quote. A mechanical control of nature, along with its associated illusion of supremacy, is what ultimately submerges us in a new subhumanity. We are dominated by nature through our enslavement to our own desires and our, our mechanical power to satisfy them. Moreover, since we mostly experience nature as a ready reserve, inasmuch as we can still think of ourselves as part of nature, we will likewise take ourselves, at least in our bodily existence, as grist for our own desirous mill. We see ourselves as material to be plied for the satisfaction of our wants, just like any other non-rational being. As the sociologist M.A. Casey puts it, following the mechanization of life, the human individual finds himself, quote, living in a social and cultural context marked by complexity, fragmentation, and dispersion that means that even as he exploits the limitlessness of possibilities, the individual finds himself its very victim, end quote. Thus humanity, quote, is being dragged along by the machines in a sort of self-consumption, end quote. For Nishtani, the situation cannot but lead to a sort of mass nihilism, quote. The mechanization of man and his transformation into a subject in pursuit of desire has opened up a sense of meaninglessness of the whole business." End quote. I do not want to suggest a sort of ludite nostalgia as a remedy for what I agree is the incipient nihilism of the technological age diagnosed by Nishtani. These sorts of suggestions are not only far from feasible and performatively inconsistent to the point of being laughable. Not only is, um, is there really no putting the genie back in the bottle, but attempts to turn back the clock also ignore what I take to be one of Nishtani's central insights. Technology, especially machine technology, is an expression of what is both transcendent in the human being and our connection with the rest of nature. Those of us in the Thomistic tradition will want to put purely contemplative pursuits on a higher pedestal, but as, as we have discussed, those pursuits are only possibilities once we have used the machine to tame nature. And we do well to celebrate our technological participation in the laws of nature as an expression of our embodiment. Is there any way out of our desirous nihilism brought on by mechanization without indulging the equally illusory pretense of rejecting our technological way of being? If the way out we are looking for is a political or even cultural program, I won't even have a guess. I'll leave that to the social scientists. My comfortable position in the proverbial philosopher's armchair gives me no insight into what will or will not change people's attitudes toward their desires and the means at their disposal for satisfying them. If, however, the question is what would be a coherent way of thinking about technology and desire that is not ensnared in the illusions we have discussed thus far, what that might be, that is something I believe we can make progress toward in this discussion. Getting people to actually think that way is another concern entirely. What I call the creationist solution comes to mind. Nature, including humanity, is not our doing. Even if it comes to be explicitly intelligible and meaningful in our distinctively human technological praxis, no, nature is a creation, and all its occupants are creatures. The universe is not our doing. We might perfect it by actualizing its potencies, but the existence of such a latently intelligible creation is the work of the creator, and our participation in its perfection is a privilege he grants us gratuitously. Nature, though we have been given dominion over it, is ultimately not ours. We are not cosmic property owners, but merely renters, whose lease requires that we return the property in good order. Thus, there are limits to the degree that nature is a standing reserve for our desire of satisfaction. Humanity's divinely endowed dominion over nature requires us of us that we steward well that with which we have been entrusted. Our consumption is ultimately limited by the capacity of nature to absorb it. 
The satisfaction of our desires via the resources afforded us by nature is limited by our duty to respect what we have been given. Moreover, since we ourselves are parts of nature, made from the very same mud, as we're told, our duty of stewardship extends to our very bodies. Our desires cannot be satisfied at the expense of the lives and dignity of human persons. Certainly I've evoked the commission of humanity as Lord over the rest of nature found in Genesis, but this, is, this sort of caution against technological exploitation of nature dates at least to Socrates' rejection of suicide in the Phaedo on the grounds that the body is the creation of gods and essentially their property to dispose of as they wish. I do not deny that our divinely ordained stewardship of nature gives us good reason to limit our technological consumption. I worry, however, whether this approach really solves the inner spiritual bankruptcy at work in our techno-nihilism. Heidegger famously rejects the creationist solution because, as he argues, it merely theologically reifies the very same hyper-technological attitude we are out to avoid. That is, the creationist solution still disposes us to have an exploitive view of nature in ourselves. Creation is the creator's machine built to serve his will. It is up to him as, uh, as to what should be done with it ultimately. I don't deny that this is true. In fact, I very much believe it, whatever Heidegger might have to say about it. But I doubt this very much changes our disposition towards nature as such. We still see nature as a ready reserve there to be exploited, but only now we might think the degree to which we can get away with such exploitation has been limited by a divine decree from the ultimate mechanical engineer. An appeal to divine property rights is not a ground for overcoming an inner spiritual bankruptcy. Of course, a good old-fashioned self-interested prudence might be a good start. The threat of nuclear annihilation, genocides at the hand of a super race of robots, a healthcare system unable to withstand the demands of, of the morbidly obese and addicted population, etc., etc., might be enough to turn us away from unbridled avarice. I am dubious about that prospect. These threats are well known and that publicity has seemed to have little effect on our hearts and minds. And once again, this doesn't seem like a source of inner conversion. Uh, warning that our gluttony and avarice are ineffective means to maximize our satisfaction is not t a terribly good way to inspire us to quit thinking of our lives in terms of the technologically driven maximization of satisfaction. Moreover, many of these problems may well have technological solutions. So appeals to prudence are always liable to allow us to kick the nihilistic can down the spiritual road. What would count for an inner conversion in our attitude towards technology? Heidegger, rather than appealing to the supposed ills of ontotheology or self-interested prudence, came to see the root problem as our typically Western tendency to think of the world as an opposition between a knowing subject, an ego, and an external object, nature. That, as you know, is a very long story to tell, but the upshot is that as long as we think of ourselves as subjects standing outside of nature, there will be a strong tendency to treat nature, and ultimately our own bodies, as something there simply to be manipulated for our ends. Instead, Heidegger suggests a sort of romantic pantheism, though certainly he would not put it that way, uh, in which the relationship between the subject and the object has been erased. Likewise, Nishtani advocates, per his own Zen Buddhist tradition, an overcoming or annihilation of a supposedly illusory ego self. In short, both existentialists suggest that we free ourselves from the obsessions of techno-nihilism by effacing the desiring subject entirely. Such would be an inner transformation indeed. And I'm not without sympathy for much of Heidegger's critique of subjectivity, especially in its modern form. After all, the gospel does ask us to give ourselves up. True enough, but I doubt we can come to rest here, at least in our current deliberations. The gospel does not only does not merely say we should give ourselves up, but also promises that if we do so, we will ultimately gain authentic life. We are told to taste and see, drink the living water, eat the bread of life, etc. In short, the gospel does not subvert the desire of subject, but promises him or her satisfaction. Christianity is not bent on overcoming desire as such, but ultimate fulfillment. Thus, our answer to technological nihilism is not the deconstruction of the desire of self entirely. We are, however, getting closer. Consider the following remark from the beginning of St. Augustine's Confessions, quote, Thou has made us for thyself, 
and our hearts are restless till they rest in thee, end quote. This restlessness is a central theme in the conversion story that follows. It is Augustine's unfulfillment, his aching and unquenchable desire that presses him through all his dark years ever closer to the turning point. But notice, St. Augustine tells us that we will never be at rest until we rest in our Creator. We should not expect satisfaction, not in this life. The point here is that for the Christian, there is no expectation of satisfaction in this life, not completely. We should expect only unfulfillment, at least in the highest sense, while we are temporarily at work here in the world. As Abraham Heschel puts it, quote, religion is the source of dissatisfaction, end quote, for it only promises unrest, an aching want in our immediate temporal circumstance. In fact, we should see this desire's restlessness as a gift. Our wanting sense of homelessness is what moves us to ever higher planes of dissatisfaction until we come to rest in our Creator. As the psalmist prays, quote, Like the deer that yearns for running streams, my soul is yearning for you, my God. My soul is thirsting for God, the God of my life. When can I enter and see the face of God? My tears have become my bread by night, by day, end quote. Does the psalmist lament his yearning? Maybe not. For the tears uh, his wanting cause him are, are also his very bread. Our unfulfilled desire is our substance on the way. It is the desire to seize God's face that moves the psalmist ever forward, despite the hardships he goes on to recount later in this verse. His aching desire is his greatest blessing, for it protects him from the ill consequences of expecting satisfaction in the goods of this world. Goods though they are, they are not food that endures to internal life. One is reminded of Sergeant Welsh's prayer at the end of Terence Malick's Thin Red Line, quote, If I never meet you in this life, let me feel your lack. A glance from your eyes, and I will forever be yours, end quote. Welsh, once an avowed atheist, comes to yearn that he might yearn. That is not very far from the kingdom indeed. My point in all this is that our way out of techno-nihilism is neither an external constraint like prudence or creationism, nor a subversion of the desiring subject. Rather, my suggestion is an affirmation of ourselves as desirous beings. It is, a, it is the illusion that all desire can and ought be satisfied in this life that technology foists on us. When that empty promise is revealed as the lie that it is, this is what makes us question the meaningfulness of the whole business. To resist these nihilistic possibilities, we need to resist that illusion. We cannot now entertain the delusion of finding our way out of the technological bottle, but we might retrain, retrain our, our psyches to affirm and even revel in our wanton nature. We can, as Isaiah advises, refuse, quote, to spend our wages on what is not bread, end quote even if that means we will never be aware of our grave hunger. Pardon me, even if that means we will ever be aware of our grave hunger. <laughs> uh, we need not discard our machines, but merely re remind ourselves that they will not bring us final satisfaction, and that is all well and good. Thank you.